Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us uh, this evening. It's a great pleasure uh, uh, meeting once again uh, for this week. And I really do appreciate uh, for those of us who've been able to join in, in time. And I will also want to extend uh, the invitation uh, to our guest speaker for today, who is uh, already in the session, that is Dr. Katrin. And we really do appreciate Dr. Katrin for joining us uh, for this session today. And uh, uh, we thank you for your sacrifice and, and your time. So we'll just start off uh, just right now on time so that at least we don't uh, take so much. So welcome so much, everyone. And uh, maybe Dr. Katrin, I'm sorry, I'm not able to share my uh, video because uh, where I am, the network is quite shaky, but that's me on the photo. Yeah, so uh, maybe you can, uh, just try to share your screen, uh, if it's possible, then I will uh, introduce you, then we can start, if that's okay. Thank you, Daniel, I'll share. Yes. Let's see if it works, okay. Do you have the big, big slide up, Daniel? Yes, yes, it's now visible. Fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so let me start off. Uh, so welcome everyone once more. Thank you so much for those who've been introducing uh, themselves in the chat. I think we can maybe pause a bit now as uh, so that is to don't disrupt. So today we are really humbled and very honored to have uh, Dr. Katrin with us. And uh, this is because uh, she's really done a lot and I've read some of her work and I'm really inspired uh, by uh, some of her research. So Dr. Katrin led the uh, global research on antimicrobial resistance project, which was based in the Big Dasta Institute, that is at the University of Oxford, uh, which partnered and they partnered with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and Tropical Medicine, uh, where they analyzed global data to estimate the global burden of antimicrobial resistance. This is the a study that led to the Gram Report 2019 that was released uh, earlier this year. And uh, she's also a member of the World Health Organization Advisory Group on Critically Important Antimicrobials for Human Medicine and a mentor for Fleming Fellows in Eswatini. And uh, now she's based at the St. George's University of London and works closely with researchers in several low and middle income countries on the ML data to inform country antibiotic guidance in local action, which is the Adila project. She's passionate about reducing the burden of AMR in the community through meaningful, simple, and sustainable interventions, such as the use of diagnostic tools, training, and communication in low and middle income countries. So welcome so much, uh, Dr. Katrin. We are really uh, humbled and honored to have you today with us. And I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Daniel, for inviting me to talk to you today. I hope I've pitched this at the, the right level without too much uh, detail, but please do ask questions at the end if you're unsure of anything. So today I would talk a little bit about how we can tackle antimicrobial resistance and the use or the appropriate use of antimi antimicrobials or antibiotics. And really about two projects that I have been involved in leading and am leading with the Graham project and Adila. So one was estimating the global burden of an antimicrobial resistance, again, very much antibiotic resistance. And the other one is using that AMR data to inform local action. So to, to work with local collaborators in country to analyze their own data, to really understand which treatments they should be giving their patients. So just as a small background, I'm sure everybody here knows what, what AMR is. And one of the, the big uh, discussions has been how big an umbrella AMR is. And the, uh, the Wellcome Trust released a report a couple of years ago that said, actually, AMR itself is one of the most complex and multifaceted health challenges that we face today as a global community. And actually that big umbrella covers bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, and the resistance that each of those uh, bugs have to the treatments that are available. And so it is quite complex. 
and the resistance is moves moves around within those different bugs in different ways they move between uh, the environment animals and humans in many different ways and so actually by saying the words amr we have a huge umbrella that we're trying to cover within that and if we think about the use of antibiotics in many places there's a lack of policy or if a policy is in place there's a lack of enforcement to make sure that people follow that policy and that can become a really difficult place to be where you know for example if you're living in um in a place where you can buy antibiotics in the pharmacy and if you if you think you're sick you can just go and buy antibiotics it's then hard not to do that you if you're able to you would just go and buy antibiotics which are cheap you don't have to see a doctor and um, you'll probably get better but that use of antibiotics is thought to be associated with an increased resistance in the bacteria and it's used in animal foods it's used by humans then you have other problems such as the medicines that are sold in many countries are substandard so maybe they don't contain enough antibiotic or maybe they contain other antibiotics and other um, substances as well as antibiotics so that becomes very difficult as well so then how can we actually tackle antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance and most of my work has been on antibiotic resistance, so I, I will just concentrate on antibiotics for the moment. Also, most of my work has been on humans. And I see many of you in the call are vets and are working in, in veterinary practice with animals, but most of my work really has centered on humans to date. So the drivers that increase resistance in bacteria. I would say that although we we think we know many many drivers actually there's the first thing is that there's limited public awareness of antibiotic resistance so to be able to understand the drivers people need to know what they are um, some of them are antibiotic use some of them use in healthcare. Um, many times Patients take antibiotics without realizing what they're taking. They may have underlying diseases, so they need to take more antibiotics as well. And often antibiotics are taken in the community. As I mentioned, they might be taken in, um, in pharmacies without really knowing what, what the patients are taking or anything. So it becomes quite difficult sometimes to really work out the amount of antibiotics being used in many places. And you need then need surveillance programs to really understand the use of antibiotics. And until recently, there was a severe lack of those surveillance programs. I think now with the Fleming Fund, we're starting to see more surveillance being put into uh, practice. And the WHO also is supporting this. But still, it, I think there's room for more and better surveillance programs to be in place. What we do know is that there is a link between antimicrobial resistance and poverty, where we see um, high, um, high severity of poverty, uh, high poverty levels, you also get high levels of AMR. And as you can see, much of Africa has not been, um, not been examined or surveyed in uh, this study that was published by Peter Collignon a few years ago, which means there are big gaps here. So we don't really understand in many countries across Africa what's happening. And the other thing, the other reminder is that I am talking about human health, but actually this is a one health problem. So we are talking, we have to think about water and other systems uh, such as WASH that would uh, alleviate antibiotic resistance, but also animals and healthcare setting as, as it's a whole picture. We as humans are not alone in this, in this problem. We are um, certainly causing higher resistance, but we're not alone. Um, so if we think 
it's a problem that's happening in a one health sphere. And we always talk about um, antibiotic use driving antibiotic resistance. And this is certainly the case with some bacteria, but is not the case with all. So we have to look at, at, the, um, at this in a more holistic way. So if we look at antibiotic use of penicillin and um, resistance, where we see an increased use of penicillin along the x-axis against the um, penis streptococcus pneumoniae that are non-susceptible to penicillin along the y-axis, what we see is the countries that use more penicillin have more non-susceptibility. I would, would say resistance, but in streptococcus, it's non-susceptible. So in France, they use a lot of penicillin and they have a lot of non-susceptible strains, the same in Spain. So you can see that there's this correlation between the use of the antibiotic and the non-susceptibility. But then if we look at uh, a bacteria such as E. coli and resistance to fluoroquinolones and third generation cephalosporins, we don't see, see that line where there's more antibiotic consumption and more resistance. What we see is more of a flat line. So there, there's no correlation here between the amount of antibiotic used and resistance to fluoroquinolones and third generation cephalosporins. So I would say that we have to be careful and examine each bacterium and each drug combination separately and really understand the different mechanisms of resistance when we're analyzing this data. So we've talked a little bit about antibiotic use and uh, possible drivers, but how can we stop antibiotic, antibiotic resistance? One of the ways that we could reduce antibiotic resistance is using vaccines. Um, and the WHO very recently published a book about the bacterial vaccines in clinical and preclinical development, where they said, okay, there are four different groups of, of pathogens with different vaccine candidates, which are in different stages of development. And what, what we see here is that some bacteria with resistance, so Acinetobacter bomaniae, we know can be quite resistant, they don't have any vaccines in the pipeline at all. Uh, and same for Enterobacter and Enterococcus faecium, no, no vaccines. And then we, when we look at something like Staph aureus that we know has quite a high incidence and burden of disease, what we see is that they have, there are some inactive vaccines and some active vaccines against Staph aureus. Um, and so even with that, there are not many vaccines against Staph aureus. We have more vaccines against Streptococcus pneumonia that we know are effective and have been proven in many countries to be effective. But what starts here is the, the lack of vaccines against some of the bacteria. So if you look at Klebsiella pneumonia, that's very low. There are hardly any vaccines there. What we've had over the last few years is, is a push by certain um, funders, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to make vaccines in these areas. So for Klebsiella, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are funding vaccines. Um, and this, this is just a segue into the, the global burden and the, the picture of political will. So the problem with anything is that we have to understand what the measure is. And with antibiotic resistance, back in 2017, when we started the, the GRAM project, estimating the burden of disease, it really was, how on earth do we measure the unmeasurable? On the flip side, if you don't measure it, how can you say what a big problem it is? So it very definitely needed to be measured, um, but it was how, how to get that measured. And we really need to needed to understand where the highest burdens of AMR were, and maybe to develop diagnostic tools and um, 
some clinical uh, clinical trials to really reduce the burden of disease. What we've seen certainly in the UK of the last few years is that the political will behind AMR has increased. Partly this was due to um, the UK government who commissioned the O'Neill report back in 2014. And the O'Neill review actually started to tell us how big a burden AMR was. The O'Neill report did cover AMR because it was both bacteria, malaria, um, and a few other things. So it wasn't just bacterial uh, in its scope. And it really did raise the profile of AMR, certainly for a few years. Um, and embedded in that, we had the Global Action Plan by the WHO and the GLASS system. So a surveillance system looking at resistance of antibacteria over space and time. Um, then we started to get the national action plans built on the global action plans. Um, and we started to get One Health Global Leaders Group. And actually for AMR, we then were brought into the G20 and the G7 meetings uh, where we were saying AMR is a problem. It's killing many people. We need to talk about this properly. And actually what we have in 2024 is a UN high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial usage. So that will really start to put AMR back on the map uh, in between the, the COVID times and the epidemic times that we have. Um, the other thing that we have is that although AMR was implicitly uh, involved in the sustainable development goals, we now have a new indicator in those SDGs looking at the percentage of bloodstream infections that were due to methicillin resistant Staph aureus and to E. coli that were resistant to third generation cephalosporins. So these become markers that we can see where, how those resistances change over time in different countries. So I'm, I'm gonna jump to the results that we have from the GRAM project, where the project really was, was the first project to synthesize global data on anti antibiotic resistance and really focus, for, for us, really focus on lower and middle income countries to get data to actually inform our estimates of the burden. And what we found was that uh, between 1.27 and nearly 5 million deaths occurred because of AMR. And what does this mean? So the, the deaths attributable to AMR or ABR were directly caused by drug resistance. And what we think here is within our modeling, we would say that the drug resistant infections are replaced by drug sensitive infections. And then if we look at the deaths associated with, within our system, within our modeling, we replace um, the resistant infections by no infection. That gives us, in my mind, that gives us the lower and the upper bounds of uh, antibiotic resistance that, that caused deaths worldwide in 2019. I have to say within this, we have the uncertainty intervals because of the modeling and because of guess um, data across that, that year and within our system, that we have uncertainty intervals around those figures. So it may be that the estimates are actually lower or even higher. Um, and within our modeling, we used um, 23 pathogens with 88 bug pathogen combinations. So this was the first time so many different pathogens were examined. This covered 471 million individual records. So it was a huge database. Um, and we found that the highest burden of disease was seen in sub-Saharan Africa with 27 deaths per 100,000 people and the lowest in Australasia with 6.5 deaths per 100,000 people. 
And when we looked at the high, the uh, infectious syndrome that had the highest deaths, what we found was that lower respiratory infections had the highest deaths with 1.5 million deaths associated with that resistance. I think I'll skip, I've got a couple of slides on the, um, the methodology, but we can come back to those if you're interested at the end. Um, so looking at the results, what we found was that six pathogens actually caused nearly 75% of the deaths. So this was that's out of that 1.27 million deaths. Um, and it, then when we looked at the, uh, the different pathogen drug combinations, there were seven that caused more than 50,000 deaths in that one year so that's huge numbers of deaths and the 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 organism that had the most deaths was uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus followed by mycobacterium tuberculosis resistant to the first two line drugs and then e coli resistant to third generation cephalosporins so those were the, the bigger killers that we saw in our modeling but what does that look like so if we Look at this graph here, we've got the pathogens on the x-axis. So these are the, the six organisms, E. coli, Staph aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Strep pneumo, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Those killed the most people in 2019. And we've got our attributable, so where our resistant strain is replaced by our sensitive strain. And then are associated with resistance, where our resistance strains are replaced by no infection. And these are actual numbers of deaths over 2019. And we see that E. coli kills the most itself, and followed by Staph aureus and Klebsiella pneumonia. And here I've highlighted the, the stars are those six organisms that are causing the highest burden of disease. And you can see for some of these, the lack of vaccines against those organisms. Uh, and these might be areas that we need to work on over the next few years. So that's, that's the overall picture of the different organisms causing disease. And then if we look at the, the countries in which the burden is highest, Perhaps unsurprisingly to you, we can see the highest burden is in Africa. So Western Sub-Saharan Africa, so all Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest burden of death. So this really is just mortality, um, followed by South Asia and Eastern Europe. And this, this, I think, really starts helps us to focus on the areas that need assistance and we need to reduce resistance. So we know sub-Saharan Africa, we know the, the organisms that are causing the highest burden of disease. And then we can actually look at those different, um, different regions and say, which organisms are causing the highest disease in these regions? So if we focus again on sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that Klebsiella pneumoniae is the biggest uh, cause of mortality in sub-Saharan Africa. So this, this graph here just shows the, the pathogen attributable fraction of death. So that's the, the smaller number of deaths. Um, so we can see that it's Klebsiella pneumoniae followed by Streptococcus pneumoniae and then E. coli in sub-Saharan Africa. And we can compare that to high income countries where Staph aureus is the, the main burden of disease, followed by E. coli and then Klebsiella pneumonia. So now we can say certain countries or certain regions have the highest burden of disease. And these are the organisms that should be uh, concentrated on in those regions. And then when we look at the resistance um, so the prevalence of resistance in a map format, what we see here is the raw data. So the data that informed our models, we can see actually for methicillin resistant staph aureus, we have quite
quite good coverage. If, if you see the white area, that means that we have no data. So even across Africa, where data was sparse, we, we have uh, data from many, many countries. Um, and here you can see the percentage of isolates with resistance. So if you have the purple up here, there, there's very small amounts of resistance, so less than 5% resistance. And then you can see Mongolia has more than 80% resistance of Staph aureus here. So what we did was to model that data using, um, using different modeling techniques and using uh, the, the proximity of countries to the countries next to them and data within other countries to really model what the resistance looked like in 2019 for, for MRSA. And this data was based on over 4.5 million isolates. We can see that um, resistance is high in Iraq, and there's concern in southern and eastern Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, with these, these darker red colours here. And we see in some countries that the prevalence really has decreased. Somewhere like the UK, the prevalence has decreased over time. And then if we look at the, the other organism in the SDGs, uh, so E. coli that's resistant to third generation cephalosporins. We have here the raw data, which shows that actually we had good coverage of data as well. Um, and you can see that data from Asia, uh, from South Asia shows a lot of resistance with the red color. And then when this is modeled, we see that there is a major problem in Asia and also in parts of Africa where there are high rates of resistance. Um, and this was based on over 5 million isolates. So this is just looking at resistance over, over space and time. So then if we think about the, the results from that burden study, what we see is that over a million people died in 2019 because of infectious diseases. And these were low respiratory infections, bloodstream infections, and inter-abdominal infections that were caused by AMR. So those were the top three uh, infections or infectious syndromes um, that young children are, are at higher risk. So one in five deaths were in children less than five years of age. Again, probably something that, that is not surprising to you living and working in, in um, these affected areas but also that only a small number of bacteria caused the majority of the deaths. Uh, and those, those are the seven bacteria, and only two of those have vaccines as an intervention program. So this really, I think, is an area that we should be exploring as researchers and thinking about what to do next. And this, this is just to highlight that our research in the GRAM project really supported what uh, the O'Neill Review um, asked for and pushed for in 2016. But six years later, there hasn't been much change or much updating of that. What we have now is more data, but we're still reinforcing the same messages. We see the highest burden of AMR in sub-Saharan Africa, with 255,000 deaths attributable to AMR. Something that, that I think is that we can have really simple improvements in WASH and IPC that would decrease the burden of AMR considerably. And actually that, that this work is evidence and we should be using this evidence to make a change. That's the only way we can, we can really push through is to make a change in many of the countries that we know have a high level of burden and need that change. So the other side of this, we've talked, I've talked a lot about antibiotic resistance, but there's also antibiotic use, appropriate and accessible antibiotic use. And some of the reasons that people use more antibiotics is that clinicians worry about what, what will happen to their patients if they don't give them antibiotics. And often there, there's a lack of diagnostic tools 
to be able to diagnose what the problem is. So, um, so empirical prescribing is often used in many countries. There's, there's a lack of trust between clinicians and microbiologists, uh, which we can explore if you want to later. And often what, what we're seeing in, in some studies is there is a high burden of resistance in the environment and in carriage, which then is transferred to resistance causing disease. Um, and in order to reduce inappropriate antibiotic prescribing, we need to have a global policy which covers antimicrobial use. But there is a lack of clarity on the WHO AMR policy goals. At the moment, the WHO is focused on um, policy for optimal anti -pres antibiotic prescribing using the AWARE system, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and it's OK. Um, but we actually need to have policy goals and indicators, particularly for oral antibiotic consumption in primary healthcare settings, because we know that a lot of antibiotic use actually happens in the primary healthcare settings, be that in pharmacies, be that in outpatients, we know that that's where the antibiotics are used a lot. And most of those antibiotics should be uh, access antibiotics. Uh, and there should be a push, a policy push towards using access antibiotics. We think within the Adila group that the AWARE system could be developed and implemented as a policy goal and as indicators for this. So what is the AWARE, um, AWARE program? This is based on the WHO model list of essential medicines, the EML list, um, which is an expert committee who developed the AWARE classification of essential antibiotics. And what we have is um, the access, the watch, and the reserve group of antibiotics, where the access group are the first or second choice antibiotics. And they should be the first antibiotics that are used for patients. Um, also, we have the, the watch group. And this group actually are more prone to be a target of antibiotic resistance. So they can increase antibiotic resistance much faster than the access group of antibiotics. And then our reserve group is our last resort, which really should A, only be used in hospitals, but B, only used for selected patients who are closely monitored, because this group of antibiotics are thought to really drive resistance a lot faster than the access or the watch group. What we have at the moment is the WHO General Programme of Work, which says that 60% um, of antibiotics should be access antibiotics at the country level. What we might want to do is say that maybe that's too low and we should increase that over time. Um, and what we've seen, our, our group have been looking at the trends in the use of aware antibiotics. while High income countries have not changed that much for the use of what antibiotics. Low income countries are starting to use more of the watch group of antibiotics, which is worrying. And we also see that um, there's more inappropriate use of antibiotics in this pink line here. Over time, we see that more patients are being um, prescribed antibiotics, say when they have a viral infection, um, and other, other areas where they shouldn't be uh, prescribed antibiotics. And we can see in this top graph that, that that's increasing, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Now this, this data is quite old, but we're, we're updating it over uh, at the moment. Um, and so what we think is that we need that global policy on AMR and, and AMU, antimicrobial use. Governance is important. We need to remind those countries that they have a commitment to AMR, and we need to hold governments accountable to tracking the progress. Here we've seen that uh, it's possible with the food producing animals 
to reduce consumption of antibiotics by 25% over a small number of years. Whereas in humans, the, uh, the consumption of antibiotics has not changed over this period in time. There, there may be um, unintended consequences here that, that will come out over the next few years. So I'm racing on to, to the next project that I'm going to discuss, which is the Adilla project. And this really is trying to, trying to work with local collaborators to influence the use of antibiotics locally. And the idea behind this is based on the, the GRAM project, where we have evidence of resistance globally, and the WHO essential medicines list, where we, we have um, guidelines saying which antibiotics should be used globally. But what we don't have is that funnel taking the resistance and the antibiotic use to a local level. So for a doctor working, say, in Nairobi, who, who has a patient with a certain infectious syndrome in front of them, if they know the antibiotic resistance level in their hospital or in their country, they know which antibiotic to prescribe the patient that comes with, say, a urinary tract infection. And it, it, the idea behind this is to make that useful locally. Uh, and how will we do this? Well, we have four areas that we're working on. We're working with hospital data, primary healthcare data, we're looking at the clinical impact and then implementation. So really working with collaborators in country. Um, and some of this is using retrospective data that's already collected, which is similar to the GRAM project. Um, looking at the hospital data, we, this, we're looking particularly for patient level data, and we're looking at the impact of concordance and discordance antibiotic use on patient outcomes. So within this, we're relating the local empiric guidance to uh, specific clinical infections on the EMO AWARE book as well. And within the hospital data, we'll be doing some modeling, looking at a, the concordance discordance, but also looking at a hypothetical clinical trial based on the data that we have and looking at anti antibiotic targets. Um, the data that what we also want to do is outline data that's needed to collect prospectively. So as researchers, when ourselves and our collaborators and other researchers are looking for data, we will be able to, to inform them which data they need to collect and how that informs their models. Uh, this, this is a um, similar to, to Graham. This is a, a really ambitious project. So we're looking at antibiotic data. Uh, well, we're looking at antibiotic resistance data. We're looking for clinical data. We're looking for outcome data and antibiotic use data. So we really are almost asking for, for every piece of data to really understand what, um, what the problem is and make sure that we're not biased in the analysis that we do. I will speed along. Um, the, the other area that we're looking at is primary healthcare data. And this really is to understand what happens in the community if we're able to. Within this, there really is a lack of data. Um, the, the, there is almost no data that I'm aware of in the primary healthcare setting. Uh, what we, we would like to do then is look at the observed and expected prescribing within countries. And something that we're, we've devised recently is um, a primary healthcare survey to then ultimately have quality indicators for the antibiotics that should be used in primary healthcare settings and then have some antibiotic targets and things. Um, and within that, we've designed something called the APC PPS, where we're, we're doing a um, work in the primary healthcare setting, and it's a point prevalence survey. And we're looking at patients who, who come to the primary healthcare in a four hour window, 
looking at the infectious syndromes that the patients come with, and then really working out which antibiotic, well, which infectious syndrome, whether they have fever, and then which antibiotic they're given if they're given antibiotics. And then to make a comparison between both the EML and the local guidelines as to what the practitioners are treating patients with. So this really will help us to understand what's being used on the ground. And then just in conclusion for the work, um, what we found with the RAM project is that um, the highest burden of AMR was seen in sub-Saharan Africa, that, that huge numbers of people died because of AMR, between 1.27 and between 5 million deaths occurred because of AMR that actually the majority of those deaths were down to seven bacteria. And we only have two vaccines against those seven bacteria. So we have a problem there. Um, there is a need to have a prioritization, prioritization of simple diagnostic court tools. Uh, particularly with, with you working in South Africa, there might be um, bacteria such as Klebsiella pneumoniae that you would want to um, push forward for a diagnostic tool and resistance within that Klebsiella. Um, and I think the important thing now is that that data doesn't just sit on a shelf or sit in a paper. We actually need to translate that evidence into action and change, change what happens in, in the countries. Um, I think there's a need to improve capacity for data management, analysis, interpretation and sharing. So from my experience, many people aren't quite sure how to analyze their data. I'm a microbiologist and I think that we need to actually have some more microbiology and diagnostic capacity to actually inform the, cl the clinical care, but also that we need targeted therapy. So less blind empirical therapy and the use of the right drug for the right bug, and a decrease of inappropriate use of antibiotics. Um, and with that, I will say a huge thank you to the many, many people who were involved in all of this work, both the Grand Project and Adila, where we have our team, our Adila team here. Many of us are based in the UK, but we have many more based in Asia and Africa as well. So thank you. Are there any questions? Wow, well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, this is uh, Anastasia. Thank you so much for the session. It has been really interesting. It has actually shed a lot of light on a lot of issues. And um, well, yes, we do have a few questions in the chat. The first question comes from uh, Bunny, and she says uh, she would like more clarity on the concept of death associated with AMR and deaths attributed to AMR, and also a bit more clarity on how the fear of AMR can push irrational prescription by clinicians. Okay, so um, the irrational fear, certainly from, from my experience and from talking to clinicians, is that they don't want to, to see a patient in um, a GP surgery in the UK and for that patient to get worse overnight because they've not been treated with antibiotics and then that patient to be admitted to hospital very sick. So they would rather give an antibiotic just in case. That tends to be what happens in the UK, but perhaps not your your local um, your local experience. Um, and for clarity around the burden estimates, I wonder if if you could explain um, if, what 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 you uh, mean by that clarity. Okay, maybe just to repeat the question was. Um, I didn't understand the concept of death associated with AMR and deaths attributed to AMR. Okay, so um, so the death associated with AMR. Let me. What I might do is bring up a little bit 
I'll share my slides again and just go through uh, how we produce those numbers. So this just shows you a little bit of the work that we did um, to model the, the deaths associated with disease. What we did was um, we had the global burden of disease est estimate. So within the global burden of disease system, not AMR, but just everybody who dies. Um, and that's then we split that into those who died with sepsis and those without. And so we just had the burden of disease with sepsis. And within that, we looked at those that died with um, infectious diseases. And um, so we have the burden of disease with sepsis. We have a probability of the infectious syndrome causing sepsis. And then we have the probability of a pathogen causing that infectious syndrome and the probability of that pathogen being resistant and the excess mortality due to that pathogen. So what that means is when we, if we take it backwards, so say we have a streptococcus pneumoniae that's non-susceptible to penicillin, that is causing a community acquired pneumonia. Um, and that pneumonia actually causes sepsis and death. And that's what we work out is those separate proportions. And we do it by different infectious syndromes. So we have to look by upper respiratory infection, lower respiratory infection, by urinary tract infection, and the different pathogens and the different resistances and sensitives. So we then look at the excess mortality because of resistance. And that excess mortality, we can't compare resistant to sensitive organisms and resistant to no, no infection. Does that make sense to you? Um, Bunny, if you could respond, uh, you can respond in the chat box as we continue on to the next question. So the next question comes from Marie. Marie. Millicent, and she's just asking, what does APC, uh, PPS stand for? No problem. That's antibiotic prescribing, it's prescri antibiotic prescribing in primary healthcare and point prevalence survey. So it's 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 an acronym of the antibiotic prescribing in primary healthcare. Thank you for that, Doctor Moore. Thank you. So I. I see that the questions in, okay, I think we can go to the, the hands that have been raised. Um, probably Idris, please. Uh, Idris Tajudin, please unmute. And then we'll have Idris Oladosu. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Sorry, let's have Idris Tajudin first, then um, Idris Old. Ladosu will go next, yes. All right, please, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Catherine, for the presentation. Please, I want to add, during the course of your presentation, you made mention of lack of awareness as being a contributing factor to AMR, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and also the issue of um, uh, um, a, uh, antibiotics being majorly used in um, primary health care. Please, man, I want to ask, how can we be able to create an awareness and explain to someone who maybe they have, we have a data, we understand AMR now, and we have some data that how and the use of an um, antibiotics contributes to antibiotics resistance. But there are some people that they just visit a community pharmacist. Maybe they just give, and they are having some discomfort and they were given some antibiotics and they get wet. And also maybe some, they have history of some of their friends, they also visit and uh, um, something like that. They have many things around them going on, which 
later on at the end of the day the person gets work so when you are trying to explain to them that this kind of things these are something that me using of antibiotics without appropriate prescription from the clinician contribute to amr they will give you some some of the evidence that they have by saying that some of their friends they visit this thing and they they were able to get well so how are we able to create an awareness and convince them that I mean, a using of antibiotics inappropriately and can lead to a later effect. Thank you, ma. That's a really good question. It just, and I, I would say that that's something that many of us in AMR are really wondering how we do that. If you look at the Global Action Plan, the first pillar that they have is creating awareness on AMR. I don't think any of us do that at the moment. <sighs> I think the barriers, many of the barriers are just not understanding culturally what's acceptable. So we, I think we need to talk to patients, to people in who go to primary health care centres and ask them how, why they're taking antibiotics and how we can change their behaviour. So I think that needs study in different countries to really understand why people take antibiotics and why prescribers give antibiotics. And it will be different in different countries. So I can't give you a simple answer, Idris. I think it needs a study to understand that. It may be that it needs that you need to have posters on the wall in outpatients, in hospitals, or in pharmacies. It may be that you need to have videos running so people can understand that maybe they don't need to have antibiotics. Maybe they give it an extra day and they won't need that antibiotic. But it also needs that patient to trust what they're being told, because if they go to one pharmacy and the pharmacist says, no, nope, I'm not going to give you an antibiotic, A, the pharmacist will lose money and B, the patient won't go back to that pharmacist, they'll go elsewhere and still buy the same antibiotic. So I, I think we really need to understand from a social science perspective why people buy antibiotics and why um, doctors prescribe those antibiotics, but in different countries. That's where I think it needs to be local information. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. Um, Idris Oladosu, please unmute and ask your question. I think that was Idris. I think there, there was someone else who asked a question. Um, okay, there were two Idrises, and the first one us. So I think um, Idris has some challenges with his um, audio. So probably we can go to one question in the chat room as we give him time to fix that. Um, so there's a question. Um, Thank you so much for the presentation. My question is that could you elaborate more on the lack of trust between mm -hmm. clinicians and the laboratory technicians as a drive of AMR? This comes from Musonda. Okay, thank you, Musonda. That again is a really good question. Um, I myself have, uh, was a microbiologist uh, running microbiology laboratories in Bien Chan in Lao and in Siem Reap in Cambodia. And, and I know from, from a lot of people that I work with that often the microbiology lab would, would do their work and print their results and the results may just go into a pigeonhole for the clinicians or the patients to pick up, but they're never picked up. So then that gives a gap between the, the microbiologist and the clinicians. The clinicians, if they don't pick up, they, they don't use the microbiology data to inform their prescribing. So they will just prescribe empirically anyway. Um, they may believe that what comes out of the microbiology lab isn't good quality data and may not trust what's reported. Um, and I've seen this in many, many different places. So often there is a big gap between the, the laboratory and the clinician. And, and there's a need to break down 
the barriers and build the trust between the different actors. So the microbiologist might have the clinician coming into the laboratory to see what they do. The clinician might then feed information back on the patient so that the microbiologist knows that the patient was treated with the right drug and got better or didn't get better and was changed to a different drug. So I think there's a lot to work on to build the trust between clinicians and microbiologists. Um, I think that could be a, a talk in itself, to be honest, where I would ask you, what do you do and or what are your experiences as well? But thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. Um, Idris, yes. Hi, thank you. The first time you mentioned Idris and we have to Idris, so I got kind of confused. <laughs> So my question, thank you very much, Dr. Kathleen. My question goes thus, that you mentioned that the highest prevalence of AML is in African countries like Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, there was this present, the APC, that the diagnostics thing going on presently. I want to ask that, is there any, any going on in Africa? Because you mentioned that like the, the research for AML needs to be localized. So if, it's, if there is one going from Africa, well, that's fine. If not, then is the data like gotten from, let's say, the developed countries like in where you are presently, is it, is, it, is it usable, like is it applicable for African countries where they have different prevalences of different, of like, of different pathogens causing the AMR? Yeah, no, another good question. I, that's where Adila comes in. I, I believe that actually the different prevalences of antibiotic resistance mean that, that the uh, infections should be treated with different, uh, different drugs. So if we know that a lot of the E. coli's are resistant to third generation cephalosporins, maybe we should be using something else to treat the infections with. So I would say that data certainly from the UK or from many high income countries should not inform what's happening in Africa. Um, within the APC PPS and the Adila project, as a whole, which is an umbrella for the APC PPS. We do have collaborators from Africa and they are providing data and we are analyzing that data. But we, we're always looking for new collaborators and yourself, uh, anybody on this call is welcome to get in touch with me and ask me um, whether you can, can join and be, uh, be working with us as collaborators. So we're looking for retrospective data on antibiotic resistance, but we're also looking for those networks of hospitals and outpatients who can run the PPS as well. Sorry, okay. I think. Anastasia has a problem with the network here. So I think we can just, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Dr. Catherine, can we pick one more question uh, just uh, from the chat because uh, we are short of time. Yes, of course. I've just shared my email as well. If people are interested, they can send me an email. Okay. Yeah, so let me, let's have uh, Opeyemi. I think uh, he addressed his hand quite early. Opeyemi, maybe. Uh, you can unmute and that's the last question. Thank you very much, doctor. And thank you for the amazing class. Um, I have a very um, question basically on the um, data collection and analysis. You mentioned something about data and I want to know which type of data collection is much appropriate for EMR. Um, would it be the quantitative or the qualitative data collection? I think that's basically just my question. Thank you. Okay, so it depends on the question, the research question that you're asking. If you're looking for the prevalence of resistance, that's quantitative data, where you're saying how many people have resistant bacterial infections. If you're looking at how do people use antibiotics, that's qualitative data, where you're asking open-ended questions and you're asking, why did you take antibiotics? Where did you go? How much did it cost? And things like that. So both both types of data have um, have areas and they should be working together, I think, in a mixed methods uh, 
research area where you you have different questions answering different questions asking questions um, but then coming together to form a bigger picture so with with the way I think of it is that you have different areas of the jigsaw that answer those questions but if you bring them all into a bigger picture you really can understand what's happening in either a small area or a larger area so it might be in one part of the country or it might be in the whole country and I think you need both is the answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I think due to time, uh, we'll stop there. For those maybe whom you have not answered their questions, you can just uh, maybe type them and, and share them with us. I, I think uh, we'll share with Dr. Katrin uh, when maybe she has some time, she can then respond. And those ones yeah. that we'll be able to respond from end, we respond. Yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, once again, for making it the session. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Katrin. That was really an eye-opener session. And uh, we also got to understand more, uh, you know, uh, about the Gram report and the subsequent project that was informed by the Gram report, which is the Adila project, uh, which I think will also be quite important, as you said, because we need uh, contextualized interventions in our different countries. I would also encourage, because uh, I know some of us are also working in hospital settings, uh, and maybe you also uh, would uh, help out in terms of the PPS, you can just contact uh, Dr. Katrin. She has shared her email address and maybe uh, you can also participate in the study because I believe the more data we have, the more uh, accurate uh, maybe it is. Yeah, at this juncture, I'll hand over to Dr. Katrin uh, for final remarks. And I think uh, we'll uh, maybe release you. Thank you so much. Over to you, Dr. Katrin. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me and for all of the insightful questions. I would be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, by email. The other thing that I didn't mention is that within both of these projects, they, they are nestled and working very closely with the uh, WHO and other global initiatives to make sure that actually we do have a change going forwards which I think is, is the important thing here. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for uh, for expounding on that. And I hope maybe we'll have you some time in the future too, so that at least uh, we lengthen the discussion. I know the, the, it's uh, a lot, and I'm also happy that at least you had a good representation of the countries. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Katrin, and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Uh, okay. Thank you, it's a pleasure, bye. Bye. Thank you very much.